It's a pleasure to be with you. The title of this session is Leishmaniasis and Global Health. There are no disclosures for this presentation. Objectives include review the global burden of leishmaniasis, review the life cycle of leishmaniasis, review leishmania clinical syndromes, review leishmania diagnostic tools, review basic treatment options for leishmaniasis, and discuss basic concepts of personal and community control measures for leishmaniasis. This table presents the global burden of major parasitic diseases. The global burden order is determined by their dailies impact in millions. This session will focus on leishmaniasis with a disability adjusted life year or daily impact of 4.3 million. Leishmaniasis is estimated to cause 10 million new cases and result in 51,600 deaths per year. Let's take a few minutes to review the concept of dailies. The Disability Adjusted Life Year, or DAILY, was first used in 1993 in the World Development Report of the World Bank. A detailed discussion of how dailies are calculated is beyond the scope of this session. A daily is a health gap measure. Daily is a measure of overall disease burden expressed as the cumulative number of years lost due to ill health, disability, or early death. The formula for daily equals YLD, or years lived with disability, plus YLL, or years of life lost. The daily relies on an acceptance that the most appropriate measure of the effects of chronic illness is time, both time lost due to premature death and time spent disabled by disease. The sum of these dailies across the population or the burden of disease can be thought of as a measurement of the gap between current health status and an ideal health situation where the entire population lives to an advanced age free of disease and disability. Leishmaniasis is a parasitic disease caused by the genus Leishmania and passed to humans by the sandfly phlebotomine vectors, including Lutzomia, Phlebotomus, and Stomoxis. Leishmaniasis is not a single disease, but a variety of syndromes that vary significantly geographically in signs and symptoms. There are three main types of leishmaniasis, visceral, often known as Kala Azar, and the most serious form of the disease, cutaneous, the most common form, and mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. Out of 200 countries and territories reporting to the World Health Organization, 97 countries and territories are endemic for leishmaniasis. Leishmaniasis is found in the rainforests of Central and South America to the deserts of Western Asia and the Middle East. It affects as many as 12 million people worldwide with 1.5 to 2 million new cases each year. The visceral form of leishmaniasis has an estimated incidence of 500,000 new cases each year. In 2014, more than 90% of new cases reported to the World Health Organization occurred in six countries, Brazil, Ethiopia, India, Somalia, South Sudan, and Sudan. As of 2010, it caused about 52,000 deaths, down from 87,000 in 1990. 
Different Leishmaniasis clinical syndromes occur in different regions of the world. Cutaneous disease is most common in Afghanistan, Algeria, Brazil, Colombia, and Iran. While mucocutaneous disease is most common in Bolivia, Brazil, and Peru. And visceral disease is most common in Bangladesh, Brazil, Ethiopia, India, and Sudan. Leishmaniasis is found through much of the Americas, from northern Argentina to south Texas, though not in Uruguay or Chile. It has recently been shown to be spreading to north Texas. Leishmaniasis is also known by a variety of names in Latin America, including Papalomoyo, Alcera de los Chicleros, and Chiclera. Leishmaniasis can be divided into essentially Old World and New World Leishmaniasis. This table summarizes the geography, reservoir, and vectors of the Old World variety. Note the organisms include two forms of Leishmania donovani, one in Asia and the other Africa. The same is true of Leishmania major, with one form seen in the Middle East and North Africa and the other in the Sudan and Sub-Saharan Africa. Leishmania tropica is seen in the Middle East, Mediterranean Basin, and Central Asia. Leishmania ethiopica, as one might expect, is seen in Ethiopia and the highlands of Kenya. The reservoirs include humans, canines, and a variety of rodents. There are seven organisms representing New World Leishmaniasis, including Leishmania donovani shigasi, Mexicana, Amazonensis, Brasiliensis, Guyanensis, Panamensis, and Peruviana. These organisms are found primarily in Central and South America. Reservoirs include canines, opossums, rodents, sloths, and anteaters. The vector is the New World sandfly, Lutzomia and Psychodopagus volcomi, similar to Lutzomia umbratilis. The literature can sometimes be confusing as to classification names of organisms. On this table, I've used the name Leishmania donovani shigasi since it is a term used in the medical dictionary for the organism. Leishmania donovani shigasi is considered the same organism as Leishmania infantum in many texts and articles. A main point is that Leishmania donovani, Leishmania infantum, and Leishmania donovani shigasi are organisms that often cause visceral leishmaniasis. Leishmania donovani in infantum in Old World countries and Leishmania donovani shigasi, also known as Leishmania infantum, in New World endemic countries. The life cycle of Leishmania essentially consists of three forms. One, amastigots found in the reticuloendothelial cells and tissues of infected mammals, including humans. Several animals are susceptible to infection, including dogs and rodents. The amastigot in mammals is infectious for the sandfly. Two, promastigots found in the sandfly vector, and three, metacyclic promastigots also found in the sandfly Metacyclic promastigots are the infectious form for mammals. This is a basic summary of the Leishmania life cycle. The sandfly is infected by biting an infected mammal, by ingesting of either infected cells or a mastigot containing tissue fluid. In the sandfly, the mastigots then move to the midgut develop into promastigots and attach to the gut lining. These promastigots divide by binary fission and become metacyclic promastigots, the infectious form for mammals. The foregut of the sandfly often becomes obstructed 
due to masses of metacyclic promastigots. When the sandfly bites while obtaining a blood meal, the metacyclic promastigots are regurgitated into the skin of a mammal host. The metacyclic promastigots penetrate macrophages of the skin, mucous membranes, lymph nodes, reticuloendothelial system, and bone marrow. Organisms can occasionally be found in polymorphonuclear cells, PMNs, in the blood, yet it's thought that the PMNs are able to destroy the parasite. These promastigots, often within as little as 30 minutes, transform into amastigots and begin proliferating within the macrophages. Infected cells eventually rupture, releasing large numbers of amastigots that infect other cells, subsequently proliferate, rupture, and release more amastigots to continue the cycle as the infection progresses. A sandfly feeding on an infected human or animal will in turn become infected by ingesting amastigots in tissue fluid or cells to complete the life cycle. The incubation period of leishmaniasis is generally two to six months with a range of two weeks to three years. The incubation period is from the time of infection to the onset of symptoms. The pathogenicity is due to a delayed hypersensitivity response of sensitized lymphocytes to granulomas formed by infected macrophages. Antibodies are not protective, yet cell-mediated immunity after infection is lifelong. Infection with Leishmania generates several types of CD4 T cells that mediate resistance to reinfection, including effector T cells, effector memory T cells, central memory T cells, and tissue-resistant memory T cells. There are essentially three responses to infection with the Leishmania parasites. One, asymptomatic infection. The parasite is killed by a successful initial immune response with no local signs noted, and the person becomes immune to reinfection with that species. Two, a local infection is established with local clinical signs and symptoms noted. The host immune response is slower than that in asymptomatic individuals, but eventually eradicates the organism, preventing dissemination. Three, dissemination of the organism occurs, including dissemination or metastases of the organism to the viscera with viscerotropic species like Leishmania donovani. Oronasal mucosal metastases, commonly seen with Leishmania brasiliensis, and more rarely with other species. Metastases to the skin with Leishmania ethiopica and Leishmania mexicana if cell-mediated immunity fails. Leishmania organisms rarely metastasize via lymphatics since the parasite is commonly destroyed in the lymph nodes. Lesions are usually seen in the cooler parts of the body like the ears and nose, possibly due to heat sensitivity of the organism. These lesions classically start with a macule and progress to a papule, blister, and ulceration. The fluid from these ulcers can be clear to purulent. These skin ulcers are usually self-limited unless secondarily infected. As illustrated, amastigots are located at the leading edge of the ulcer, not in the base, which will essentially only demonstrate granulation tissue. Let's now consider some common Leishmaniasis clinical syndromes and start with old world cutaneous Leishmaniasis. Old world cutaneous leishmaniasis is primarily found in the barren, sandy, arid regions of the Middle East, tropical Africa, and the old USSR. Reservoir hosts include 
urban dogs, wild rodents, and humans. As expected, the organisms are found in the macrophages of the skin. Old world cutaneous leishmaniasis generally affects only the skin, where several new world organisms affect not only the skin, but also the mucous membranes, causing mucocutaneous disease. There are generally two types of old world cutaneous leishmaniasis, dry or urban and wet or rural. Dry or urban cutaneous leishmaniasis is also known by various names, including Oriental Sore, Aleppo Button, Jericho Boil, or Delhi Boil. Organisms causing dry leishmaniasis include Leishmania tropica, Leishmania infantum, and Leishmania ethiopica. This form of old world cutaneous leishmaniasis is less aggressive than wet or rural cutaneous leishmaniasis. The incubation period for Leishmania tropica is generally from two to four months, but can be up to two years. The incubation period for Leishmania infantum is up to one year. Ulceration in dry cutaneous leishmaniasis is slow or may not even occur. Healing is relatively slow compared with the wet cutaneous form. Leishmania tropica generally heals in 10 to 14 months, Leishmania infantum in one to three years, and Leishmania ethiopica in two to five years. Even with treatment, Leishmania ethiopica is associated with frequent relapses. Leishmania major is the primary organism causing wet cutaneous leishmaniasis. The incubation period for wet cutaneous leishmaniasis is usually one to two months. Rural wet cutaneous leishmaniasis often results in early ulceration and is commonly seen in multiple sites. This is a more aggressive form of cutaneous leishmaniasis associated with increased tissue reaction with induration. Wet lesions reach their peak size of three to six centimeters over a two to three month period, followed by healing in three to six months, unless complicated by secondary infections. Leishmania tropica primarily causes old world cutaneous leishmaniasis, but occasionally will begin as an ulcer at the mucocutaneous junctions of the mouth or nose and progress to cause mucocutaneous disease. There is a tuberculoid form of leishmaniasis. This is occasionally associated with Leishmania ethiopica infection and presents with lymphangitis resulting in lymphatic obstruction and lymphedema. This lymphedema is called elephantiasis. The most common cause of elephantiasis is filariasis in endemic areas, yet Leishmania should be considered as a potential cause in areas where Leishmania ethiopica is prevalent. Let's now consider New World Cutaneous and Mucocutaneous Leishmaniasis. To review, there are seven organisms representing New World Leishmaniasis, including Leishmania, Donovani Shigasi, Mexicana, Amazonensis, Brasiliensis, Guyanensis, Panamensis, and Peruviana. As mentioned previously, Leishmania donovani shigasi is the same organism as Leishmania infantum that causes old world visceral and cutaneous leishmaniasis. The organisms listed on this table are found primarily in Central and South America. Leishmania mexicana, amazonensis, brasiliensis, guyanensis, panamensis, and peruviana generally cause cutaneous or mucocutaneous diseases, but not visceral leishmaniasis like Leishmania donovani shigasi. Animal reservoirs include canines, opossums, rodents, sloths, 
and anteaters. The vector is the New World sandfly, Lutzomia and Psychodopagus welcomi. That's similar to Lutzomia umbratilis. New World cutaneous leishmaniasis clinically presents like Old World cutaneous leishmaniasis, as demonstrated in this picture of a skin lesion from a gentleman in French Guyana, South America. New World leishmaniasis often causes more than just cutaneous lesions. It can also involve the mucous membranes causing mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, often called a spundia in Central and South America, affecting the mucous membranes of the nose, pharynx, and mouth. Leishmania brasiliensis is the most common cause of a spundia. 80% of the cutaneous ulcers caused by Leishmania brasiliensis heal within one year, yet 15% of these patients, if not treated, will have recrudescences of the infection or experience secondary infections. Sores may appear at sites of an injury. Between 2 to 40% of patients with cutaneous ulcers due to Leishmania brasiliensis and a much smaller proportion of those due to Leishmania guyanensis, panamensis, and peruviana will develop metastatic mucosal lesions. Sometimes mucosal lesions begin after cutaneous ulcers heal. The nose is the most common site of mucosal infection. Mucocutaneous disease may be worse in blacks. 50% of mucosal lesions arise within two years of the cutaneous ulcer and 90% within 10 years, though delays up to 35 years have been reported. 15% of individuals who develop mucocutaneous disease have no history of skin ulcers. As previously mentioned, the nose is the most common site of mucosal spread of the infection. One third of cases have mucosal spread to other sites beyond the nose, including the pharynx, larynx, and upper lip in that order of frequency. Young males with multiple or chronic lesions, particularly above the waist, are at greatest risk. The progression of mucocutaneous leishmaniasis is demonstrated on this slide. The first clinical sign is a granuloma or nodule that develops on the nasal septum. This is followed by septal perforation. The nasal cartilage subsequently collapses and the infection spreads throughout the oronasopharyngeal mucosa. It may eventually cause dysphonia if involving the larynx. It may also predispose to pneumonia due to the inability to clear respiratory secretions. A spondia is occasionally seen presenting with hypertrophy of the nose and or mouth. This slide shows the aggressive type of surgery often performed to reconstruct a destroyed nose due to a spondia using a skin flap from the forehead as an initial procedure. This obviously isn't the final outcome and will require several additional surgical procedures. This table provides some additional information about Leishmania guyanensis, panamensis, peruviana, mexicana, and amazonensis. Leishmania guyanensis infection is also known as pianbois or bushyaws in Latin America. Leishmania guyanensis often causes multiple lesions on the trunk or limbs. Lymphatic spread is seen in up to 50% of these cases. Lymph channels are palpably thickened and contain nodules that may ulcerate. Facial lesions often present with a brawny edema. Leishmania panamensis is associated with lymphatic lymph node and ulcers that may persist for years. Leishmania peruviana causes a disease called UTA. Lesions are commonly seen on the face and heal in three to six months, leaving scars for life. In children, 
Leishmania peruviana commonly causes solitary facial lesions. Leishmania peruviana does not metastasize to the mucous membranes, but lesions can be found on the mucocutaneous junctions of the nostrils and lip margins. Leishmania mexicana commonly causes sores on the side of the face or on the ears that heal in six to eight months and are commonly called chiclero ulcers. If involving the pinna of the ear, it can result in destruction of the cartilage and deformity. Leishmania amazonensis usually causes solitary lesions and generally doesn't result in lymphatic involvement. Yet a much greater proportion of Leishmania amazonensis cases develop into diffuse cutaneous anergic leishmaniasis versus other New World organisms. Diffuse cutaneous anergic leishmaniasis is the rule, not the exception, with Leishmania amazonensis in the Dominican Republic. This is a picture of Pian Bois caused by Leishmania guyanensis. Notice the lymphatic involvement with nodules and ulceration. The left picture demonstrates the Chiclero ulcer on the ear caused by Leishmania mexicana. The right picture demonstrates a permanent deformity of the pinna of the ear due to Leishmania mexicana destruction of ear cartilage. Leishmania amazonensis often results in diffuse cutaneous anergic leishmaniasis as pictured on this slide. Let's briefly consider the unusual forms of cutaneous leishmaniasis. There are a few unusual forms of cutaneous leishmaniasis, including recidiva and diffuse cutaneous anergic leishmaniasis. Recidiva is also known as lupoid leishmaniasis. Recidiva is rare and can be associated with both new and old world cutaneous leishmaniasis. The word recidiva means recurrence. So the recidiva form of cutaneous leishmaniasis is associated with relapsing cutaneous lesions. In recidiva, red-brown or yellow papules occur around the edge of ulcers that continue a cycle of healing, ulceration, and healing over many years. Since this is a hypersensitivity response, few amastigots are found in specimens from the ulcer's edge. Another unusual form of cutaneous leishmaniasis is called diffuse cutaneous anergic leishmaniasis. As previously mentioned, diffuse cutaneous anergic leishmaniasis is very common with Leishmania amazonensis infections in Latin America. Anergy means the absence of a normal immune response Therefore, diffuse cutaneous anergic leishmaniasis presents with disseminated cutaneous lesions as demonstrated in the left picture. As might be expected with a decreased immune response, tissue specimens from these patients contain large numbers of amastigots. This is another picture of a patient with diffuse cutaneous anergic leishmaniasis. Let's now consider the clinical aspects of visceral leishmaniasis seen in endemic areas worldwide. Visceral leishmaniasis is found in focal areas of more than 60 countries. In the Old World, in parts of Asia, particularly South, Southwest, and Central Asia, Africa, particularly East Africa, the Middle East, and Southern Europe, and in the New World, particularly Brazil. More than 90% of the world's cases of visceral leishmaniasis occur in South Asia, India, 
Bangladesh and Nepal, East Africa, Sudan, South Sudan and Ethiopia, and Brazil. Visceral leishmaniasis is seen in both Old World and New World countries, caused by Leishmania donovani, Leishmania infantum, and Leishmania donovani shigasi. Some patients with visceral leishmaniasis on the Indian subcontinent develop a darkening of the skin that results in visceral leishmaniasis being termed kala azar, a Hindi word meaning black sickness. Risk factors include malnutrition, immunosuppression, like organ transplantation, steroids, HIV infection, and hematologic malignancy. Clinical visceral leishmaniasis is an immune-associated disease that manifests as a failure of cell-mediated immunity. This cell-mediated deficit can be demonstrated by a negative response to a Leishmanin skin test during the active disease process. The Leishmanin skin test turns positive with resolution of the infection. Latent visceral infection can activate years to decades post-exposure in people who become immunosuppressed. This impaired cell-mediated immunity explains the association of clinical visceral leishmaniasis with secondary infections. The infectious sequence is shown on the left side of this slide. Following the infectious bite of a sandfly, a cutaneous infection is established. A mastigots are then transmitted through the reticuloendothelial system and infect other organs, including the spleen, liver, and bone marrow. Secondary infections often associated with visceral leishmaniasis include measles, pneumococcal pneumonia, bacillary dysentery, brucellosis, and tuberculosis. Visceral leishmaniasis can be asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. When clinically symptomatic, signs and symptoms are fairly uniform and include those listed on this table. All patients have fever, weight loss, and splenomegaly. In expatriates and during epidemics, onset is acute with fever and chills. Approximately three quarters of symptomatic patients have abdominal pain, cough, and hepatomegaly. Approximately half have epistaxis and diarrhea, 27% edema and 5% jaundice. Severe epistaxis or nosebleeds is not uncommon, though other hemorrhagic complications are rare except for occasional retinal hemorrhage. In Africa, 84% have lymphadenopathy versus only 5% in India. As previously mentioned, hyperpigmentation of the skin is seen in 70% of Indian patients, occasionally in African patients, versus none in Europeans. This hyperpigmentation or darkening of the skin primarily affects the face, hands, and upper torso, giving rise to the Hindi word Kala Azar, which means black sickness. Other common general symptoms include malaise, headache, dizziness, or anorexia. Healing is often associated with the development of tuberculoid granulomas of the liver. The clinical course of symptomatic patients often includes exhaustion, emaciation due to malabsorption and malnutrition, abdominal distension due to hepatosplenomegaly and intercurrent infections. Visceral leishmaniasis can also cause nephritis, uveitis, and post kala azar Leishmania dermatitis. There is an 80 to 90% mortality without treatment. post kala azar dermal Leishmaniasis follows a Leishmania donovani infection. These patients usually have a history of previous treatment for visceral Leishmaniasis or a history of a self-healing febrile visceral Leishmania-like illness. Yet some patients have no history suggestive of visceral leishmaniasis. post kala azar dermal leishmaniasis is mainly seen in Sudan and India, where it follows treatment 
for visceral leishmaniasis. In the Sudan, 50% of cases will develop post Kala Azar dermal leishmaniasis post treatment versus 5 to 10% in India. The interval between treatment and onset of post Kala Azar dermal leishmaniasis is 0 to 6 months in Sudan and 2 to 3 years in India. In India, post Kala Azar dermal leishmaniasis starts as hypopigmented spots sparing the scalp, palms, soles, axilla, and perineum. This is often followed by nodules that may become large. The disease progresses without treatment and may look like leprosy without peripheral nerve involvement. In the Sudan or Kenya, post Kala Azar dermal leishmaniasis presents with a transient papular rash or crops of papules over the face or forearms that heal spontaneously in a few months. Rarely will this progress to large nodules as described in the Indian form. Other laboratory abnormalities associated with visceral leishmaniasis include occasional proteinuria, 5% of Indian cases have irreversible impaired renal function. Liver function tests are generally normal despite marked hepatomegaly. Albuminemia. Pancytopenia is the rule with neutropenia, eosinopenia, and thrombocytopenia common. The thrombocytopenia or low platelets may partly explain the occasional severe epistaxis. Other coagulation factors are also low yet disseminated intravascular coagulation is uncommon. Anemia may be severe and rapid in onset and is associated with suppressed reticulocytosis. This lack of reticulocytosis indicates that there is decreased erythrocytosis in the bone marrow versus just increased red blood cell destruction. This lists some of the common tests and procedures used to diagnose leishmaniasis worldwide. Some of the more sophisticated laboratory tests may only be available in high resource countries. Tests and procedures for leishmaniasis include one, physical examination, which includes the characterization of clinically visible signs of leishmaniasis, like those on the skin or mucous membranes, and examining patients for enlargement of the liver, spleen, lymph nodes, etc. Two, microscopic examination. The microscopic examination looks for emastigots in spleen, liver, bone marrow, lymph nodes, blood, buffy coat, and skin lesion specimens. The buffy coat is obtained by concentrating all of the white blood cells and platelets from a sample of blood. Specimens from skin lesions may be obtained through biopsies, skin slit smears, or smears taken from the edge of an ulcer. A mastigots can be isolated from up to 80% of ulcers during the first half of the illness. This chart demonstrates the yield of organisms based on various tissues sampled to diagnose visceral leishmaniasis. There is some regional variation, particularly in the yield of buffy coat specimens, with those from India having better yield at 67 to 99% versus 50% in Africa. The spleen has the greatest yield at greater than 95% followed by the liver and bone marrow at 85%. Though splenic aspiration has the highest yield, the procedure can be associated with life-threatening hemorrhage. Therefore, bone marrow aspiration is safer and generally preferred. Biopsied or aspirated lymph nodes have a 64% chance of demonstrating the organism and are most useful in a field setting. Three, Leishmania can be grown on a variety of culture media with the choice of media based on species of interest. Culture media includes NNN, diphasic rabbit, insect tissue culture agar, etc. 
smears and culture are usually adequate to diagnose cutaneous leishmaniasis. Four, immunoperoxidase staining may be a helpful diagnostic tool to find scant organisms. Five, hamster inoculation has been used to diagnose mucosal lesions. Six, serology. Many current Leishmania serology tests detect antibodies to the recombinant K39 antigen of the organism. Generally, antibodies are not very useful in diagnosing cutaneous leishmaniasis since antibody titers in that form of the disease are low. In mucocutaneous disease, antibody titers are consistently higher and therefore useful in diagnosis. The enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, ELISA, is highly sensitive and specific for mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. Like all technologies, immunodiagnosis of parasites like leishmaniasis is constantly changing. 7. Polymerase chain reaction PCR, a sensitive, rapid assay for Leishmania DNA. 8. Leishmanin skin test. No Leishmanin skin test preparations have been approved for use in the United States, though it is used in other countries. The Leishmanin skin test is positive in greater than 90% of cutaneous and mucocutaneous Leishmaniasis. The skin test is primarily a measure of cell-mediated immunity. This test uses a suspension of washed promastigots in a standardized solution of 0.5% phenol in saline. Promastigots are part of the Leishmania life cycle in the sandfly. 0.1 milliliters of skin test solution is inoculated intradermally like the tuberculosis skin test into the volar or inner surface of the forearm and the area of induration is measured at 48 to 72 hours. A positive Leishmanin skin test reaction is also called the Montenegro sign. Leishmania Ethiopica infections or cases of mucocutaneous Leishmaniasis with multiple sites of disease are less frequently positive. This slide lists some general treatment considerations. Before considering treatment, the first step is to make sure the diagnosis is correct. Treatment decisions should be individualized. Factors to consider include the form of Leishmaniasis, the Leishmania species involved, the potential severity of the disease and the patient's underlying health. The skin sores of cutaneous leishmaniasis usually heal on their own, even without treatment, but this healing process can take months or even years and the sores can leave ugly scars. Another potential concern applies to some but not all types of Leishmania parasites found in parts of Latin America that can spread from the skin to the mucous membranes of the nose, mouth, or throat, causing mucosal Leishmaniasis, and without treatment can result in marked deformity, as noted in this picture. Mucosal Leishmaniasis might not be noticed until years after the original sores heal. Adequate treatment of cutaneous infection may help prevent mucosal leishmaniasis. If not treated, severe or advanced cases of visceral leishmaniasis are usually fatal. This is a quote from the leishmaniasis section of the Red Book Report of the Committee on Infectious Diseases published by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Systemic antileishmanial treatment is always indicated for patients with visceral or mucosal leishmaniasis, 
whereas not all patients with cutaneous leishmaniasis need to be treated or require systemic therapy. Treatment options for leishmaniasis consist of essentially three different modalities, physical, topical, and systemic treatments. Physical and topical therapies should only be considered for focal cutaneous infections. Dosing and adverse reaction details are complex and beyond the scope of this session. For more dosing information, refer to references listed on this slide. The Red Book, Report of the Committee on Infectious Diseases, American Academy of Pediatrics, and the CDC Leishmaniasis Treatment Guidelines. Physical treatment consists of surgical excision, curatage, heating, and freezing. Surgical excision usually works for small facial lesions. In good hands, this therapy results in a more acceptable scar. Curatage under anesthesia essentially accelerates healing to three to six weeks. Heating of tissues to 39 to 40 degrees centigrade kills Leishmania parasites and accelerates healing. Freezing with liquid nitrogen is effective for small, well-defined lesions with little surrounding inflammation. Aminosidine or paramomycin topically with or without methyl benzethonium or gentamicin may cure 12 to 80% of old world cutaneous leishmaniasis, particularly in cases caused by Leishmania major. Topical paramomycin should only be used in geographic regions where cutaneous leishmaniasis has a low potential for mucosal spread. Aminosidine and methyl benzethonium has been partially effective in some patients with cutaneous leishmaniasis caused by Leishmania mexicana and Leishmania brasiliensis in Guatemala where mucosal spread is very rare. The methyl benzethonium causes irritation of the skin, therefore lesions may worsen before they improve. Other topical therapies include the infiltration of sodium stiboglucanate or megalamine antimoniate for small sores without significant inflammation. This sequence of pictures is an example of the response of cutaneous leishmaniasis to topical treatment. In this study, topical therapy consisted of a cream composed of 15% paramomycin with 0.5% gentamicin. Systemic therapies recommended by the CDC are listed on this slide. Cutaneous leishmaniasis is treated systemically with sodium stiboglucanate or miltefacine. Mucosal and mucocutaneous leishmaniasis with sodium stiboglucanate, amphotericin B, or miltefacine and visceral leishmaniasis or Kala Azar with liposomal amphotericin B, sodium stiboglucanate, miltefacine, or amphotericin B deoxycholate. Therapeutic courses range from 20 days to eight weeks. The cure rate for systemic antimonials in the treatment of New World mucocutaneous leishmaniasis varies from 30 to 91 percent depending on the severity of the disease. The cure rate for systemic treatment of visceral leishmaniasis or Kala Azar may be as high as 97 percent with the drug miltefacine. This slide provides interesting information about sandfly behaviors. This is obviously not exhaustive, but meant to illustrate the importance of understanding vector behaviors to appropriately control vector-borne diseases. Rainfall, humidity, and temperature impact the biting behavior of sandflies. In tropical areas, the 
Sandfly does not usually bite when temperatures are less than 20 degrees centigrade or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Phlebotomus, Papatasi, is most active when the relative humidity is between 45 and 60 percent, where other species require 75 to 85 percent. Flight range of some species is longer in humid conditions. For example, Phlebotomus sargenti. Other factors affecting biting include the following. Wind speeds of greater than 1.5 meters per second decrease flight. Sand fly flight ceases at winds greater than 4 to 5 meters per second. Lutzomia umbratilis rests in tree buttresses in the day and fly vertically to the canopy at night. So there are diurnal and nocturnal factors, much like mosquito-borne diseases. There are also different sandfly vectors in different strata of the rainforest canopy. For example, the sandfly vector for Leishmani amazonensis feeds on the forest floor, where the sandfly vector for Leishmani apanamensis feeds on mammals higher in the forest canopy. As expected, humans are usually infected by vectors biting humans on the forest floor. A main point is that effectively controlling infections like Leishmania and other vector-borne diseases require a detailed understanding of vector behaviors. Control measures for Leishmaniasis can be divided into two major categories, personal and community. The following are control measures to consider for individuals. Avoid endemic areas during seasons of transmission. Stay in well-screened or air-conditioned areas when feasible from dusk to dawn when sandflies are most active. Use fine meshed bed nets impregnated with permethrin and tuck the net under the mattress. When outside, wear long sleeved shirts and long pants and socks. Use insect repellents containing DEET on exposed skin and under the ends of sleeves and pant legs. Spray clothing with pyrethroid containing insecticide several days before visiting an endemic area. Spray living and sleeping areas with an insecticide. And vaccination when an approved, safe, and effective vaccine is available. Sandflies are smaller than mosquitoes, therefore bed netting should have at least 18 holes per inch. The following lists reasonable measures for the control of leishmaniasis at the community level. These measures were adapted from World Health Organization WHO recommendations. One, animal reservoir measures. Treatment of infected dogs on the island of Elba decreased the leishmania prevalence in dogs from 12% to 5%. With this treatment of dogs, there are concerns about development of Leishmania resistance to anti-Leishmanial drugs. In some endemic areas, animal hosts, including rodents and dogs, are eliminated to decrease the host pool. For example, the elimination of gerbils and their burrows worked in the Middle East and the old USSR to decrease human cutaneous leishmaniasis by a factor of 10. This not only decreased the animal reservoir, but also the sandfly population. Two, case finding and treatment of infected humans is important. For example, aggressive case finding and treatment essentially eradicated cutaneous leishmaniasis in Azerbaijan, but was not enough to control cutaneous leishmaniasis in India, where sandfly spraying along with case finding and treatment was necessary to demonstrate an impact. Three, sandfly control. Residual spraying for sandfly vectors has been helpful in some endemic areas. Four, vaccination of humans and animal hosts when effective vaccines are available may also help control leishmaniasis at the community level. Five, 
education of the public regarding Leishmania transmission, epidemics, and practical control measures is also an important tool to address Leishmaniasis. There are several human vaccines in various phases of development, some using a variety of inactivated parasite antigens and others attenuated parasites. Vaccination with live virulent Leishmania major has been used in the Middle East for centuries and is used by some armed forces in Leishmania endemic areas. This vaccination process gives a local infection at a less visible inoculation site versus the development of ulcers and scars on the face with wild disease. Vaccination with Leishmania major can result in recidiva or recurrent ulcers. This vaccine is not available or approved in the United States. Another promising approach is vaccination of dogs. For example, in 2008, a vaccine for dogs was launched in Brazil, Leishtech, a recombinant protein-based vaccine. In 2011, Canny Leash, a canine vaccine made with antigens from Leishmania infantum, was licensed in Europe. Vaccination of dogs in endemic areas may decrease the animal reservoir of Leishmania parasites and subsequently decrease infection in humans. There are three major sets of tools to change risky behaviors like those associated with leishmaniasis. Policy, influencing an individual one-on-one, -on -one, the clinical, and population-based interventions. Policy is developed by local, state, and federal governments, businesses, and organizations. It is an effective tool to encourage healthy behaviors, but must be implemented and enforced to be effective. Clinicians are trained in one-on-one -on -one counseling, another powerful strategy to change risky behaviors. Population-based interventions provide another potent behavioral impact and can be subdivided into two tool subsets, social marketing and community engagement. Population-based expertise lies in the discipline of public health. We need to use all these tools in a coordinated, integrated way to change risky behaviors in our populations. There are four basic attributes of successful programs for changing risky behaviors, including high-level leadership support, use of best and promising practices, adequate resources, and community engagement. Leadership support is essential for effective programs in changing risky behaviors. A national program requires support from the president or the president's wife, a state program, the governor, a city program, the mayor, and a business, the chief executive officer. The use of best or at least promising practices is extremely important. Implementing poor ideas results in poor outcomes. Promising practices are often needed in special circumstances to help define best practices. Adequate resources include people, time, and funding. Community engagement brings an additional set of tools to the health messaging toolkit to change risky behaviors that ultimately will improve quality of life and decrease health care costs. In summary, leishmaniasis is the third leading parasitic cause of dailies globally. More than 90% of the world's cases of visceral leishmaniasis occur in South Asia, East Africa, and Brazil. Leishmania is passed to humans by infected sandflies. Leishmaniasis can cause asymptomatic, cutaneous, mucocutaneous, and visceral infections. Untreated visceral infections are often fatal. Many cutaneous infections heal spontaneously. Personal and community control measures can reduce 
Leishmania infection rates. Take your public health practice skills to the next level. Our specialized certificate courses give you an opportunity to work systematically through a public health topic and demonstrate your understanding of that material in a capstone project. Learn more and sign up at ndphtn.com certificates.